Good afternoon, gents. Good afternoon. How are you? Uh, good, thank you. Yeah, did have to go and r r find a tie from the wardrobe that uh, dust it off a little bit. <laughs> I was wearing a polo shirt this morning. I had to do a Superman <laughs> change. <laughs> that has been uh, it's been a good morning so far. Very interesting. Subject. It works well, actually. You know, better than expected. You do keep engaged. I mean, everyone's obviously got their emails pinging around in the background, but it's good. Absolutely. We've got a, another minute or so before uh, we're scheduled to start, so we'll just when there's a few people logging on and joining us. So. How are you, Harry? No. Technical problems. You hear us okay, Harry? Maybe it'll be I have to be sign language. We can see you, but we can't hear you. Like a restart now. Okay, so we'll give them a second to, to rejoin. What's the football step, or is it rugby in the back? Uh, that is a South Africa rugby jersey. Yes, signed by a signed by a couple of World Cup winners. Stuff. Sadly, I haven't got the Scotland one with the World Cup winner signatures on it yet. But uh, you live in hope. <laughs> I have a Gavin Hastings ones at home. That's a nice one to have. Well, I guess we should get started as uh, hopefully Harry can join back in again. So good afternoon and welcome to the offshore panel session of today's virtual conference. Uh, our session is sponsored by Anglo Eastern uh, with no formal presentations as such. Um, we were told the presentation would last about 45 minutes, but I think we've added an extra 15 minutes onto it based on the, the agenda. So hopefully we can uh, pad it out a little bit and maybe some questions at the end. Um, the, the plan is that our panel members will have a high level thoughts on the challenges and opportunities that we face over the next decade and then we have some uh, pre-scheduled questions that have been set as well and um, if anyone would like from the audience to ask any questions if you can pop that into the chat function and we'll attempt to get those at the end so i'll start with a, a little bit of an introduction um, my name is john geddes as, as well as chairing the chamber or panel meetings. My day job is Managing Director of Tidewater Marine for the North Sea, the Med and Europe. I worked with Gulf Mark Offshore for 25 years before the merger with Tidewater two years ago. Uh, my background is finance and uh, the commercial side of the business until about five years ago getting the role as, as MD. Um, Tidewater is a company, our US headquartered, one of the largest owners and operators of OSVs predominantly PSVs um, and have been in the business for over 60 years supporting the offshore energy exploration and production activities around the world. Um, I'd be pleased to be joined by the other panel members. First of all, Eric Ronsberg, Chief Executive Officer of Stena Drilling. Eric has worked in the offshore business for over 25 years, uh, first as an offshore rig surveyor, then in shipyards, following up construction of new build drilling rigs. Uh, with uh, a lot of international experience, time in the US, Canada, Norway, and the Far East. As most of you know, Stena are one of the world's foremost independent drilling contractors. We also have uh, Brian Lynch, who has over 20 years of experience in the subsea industry, covering a range of activities from offshore project management to marine operations. 
He currently holds two senior roles within uh, Technique FMC's Fleet Management Organization, uh, Director of Project and Director of ROV and Equipment Services. Uh, with the Director of Project, Brian is accountable for uh, significant internal capex projects, class renewal dockings, conversions and new builds. And in his Director of ROV and Equipment, he looks after Technique's flexible pipeline equipment and support bases. Um, our fourth member, who seems to be having some technical difficulties at the at the moment, um, is Harry Jarvis, Group, Group Fleet and Equipment Director, Offshore Resources with Subsea 7. Harry has a background as an electrical engineer and over 20 years experience in a variety of marine technical management roles uh, with over a decade as technical manager uh, for marine and ROV for Subsea 7. So hopefully Harry can join us again, but if not, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll muddle through. Um, as I mentioned, we do have some specific questions that we'll address, but we'll start with the high level overview. Um, I know that it's quite hard at the moment with all the issues we're dealing with uh, the pandemic to actually think much further than what's happening next week, but uh, we've been asked to uh, look forward 10 years and give our thoughts on the challenges and the opportunities that we see in the, in the decade. So, uh, Eric, if uh, you would like to take that first, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Okay, thanks, Ian. Well, as uh, as Ian said, you know we're a we're a small privately owned uh, joint contractor based in Aberdeen and a subsidiary of Senna AB based in Gothenburg. We manage a fleet of four ultra deep water drill ships and two mid water harsh environment semi submersibles. I'm happy to say that all our units fly the the British flag. So, with regards to the challenges for the next ten years. Well, it's, it is difficult to deliberate on this at the moment when we're all facing the massive challenges brought on by COVID-19. Our immediate key challenge then is dealing with this and the fact that we have three drill ships working in countries on the UK red list. With the latest news that seafarers may not get exemptions, I'm rather concerned that our crews may have to spend 10 days in a UK quarantine hotel in addition to the weeks they've just had offshore. So this may tip many over the edge and that's why we are appealing for help from the UK government and the Chamber of Shipping. The health and safety of our colleagues on and offshore is paramount for us, particularly working in a potentially hazardous industry. So we really need solutions here. And the question will be for how long the lockdown and quarantine situation continues. This problem on the other hand is driving innovation into digital solutions, potentially to reduce manning offshore uh, in the future. So moving on, a key challenge is how drilling contractors will survive with potentially declining opportunities in the oil and gas industry over the next 10 years. It is interesting to look at history in this case and also try foreseeing requirements for the future. With regards to the offshore drilling business, we have lived with a boom and bust cycle for many years. In times of demand, usually driven by stable and higher oil prices, we have seen money pour into the sector to invest in new builds and upgrades of older vessels. But this has often resulted in an oversupply of rigs, and a good example of this was between 2006 and 2016, where a huge number of drill ships were ordered, mainly from yards in the Far East. There it's for our services, and they went through the roof during that time, luring investors looking for quick returns. But in 2014, when the oil prices started to drop, this created a real shock for drillers due to the oil companies terminating contracts and slowing tenders. Oversupply led to stacking of rigs followed by scrapping, and since 2014, over 150 drilling units have been scrapped, taking the floating drilling unit fleet down to around, around 170 or thereabouts today, split between drill ships for deep waters and uh, semi submersibles for typically shallow waters. Many drillers have been faced by bankers of weight, so this is also likely to change the supply demand picture with more scrapping of stacked rigs likely due to the huge investments necessary to get them reactivated. Since then, the oil price has strengthened, and this will hopefully lead to more sustainable business for us. And so a real key challenge for us will be navigating further boom bust cycles over the decade, but being careful with maintaining our assets and the contracts we enter. The next key challenge for us is how our industry is portrayed in the media and perceived by the general public. Climate change and energy transition is in the forefront of many of our minds now, and while we fully support this, we will still need oil and gas for quite some time yet. As we've seen in Shell's BP and DV energy outlooks, oil and gas will still need to play a significant part uh, in our future. And with around 30% of oil and gas coming from offshore fields, there will remain a place for joint contractors for many years yet. 
that doesn't always register with the public all the same, but all of us in this industry need to work together to eliminate accidents, reduce emissions and care for the environment. I'm also personally concerned about attracting new talent. We've endured a long downturn and that combined with public perception to the oil and gas industry puts great pressure on recruiting the most talented to the industry in the future. We really need to remain relevant. The, the offshore industry has been good at innovating and while we focused a lot on joint technology in the past, more innovation is now going into initiatives like battery hybrid solutions for our rigs to reduce fuel use, research into alternative fuels, and we're also looking at geothermal and CO2 sequestration drilling. The drive to cut waste is important, as is doing what we can to drive towards carbon neutral operations for both ourselves and our clients. We're now harnessing digital solutions, and an example is where we at Stena, we're, we're using Kongsberg's Cognify system to better measure fuel and emissions across our fleet and examine differences between the four near identical drill ships we manage. But frustratingly, some of these initiatives do require high capital investment. I think we would have been further on with some of these projects if we had access to innovation funds, much like the ANOVA fund in Norway, where much of the cost is covered through government regulated grants. And we've seen some of our competitors able to upgrade their rigs ahead of us due to that. So to close, the question remains whether and when there will be new rigs built in the future, whether that will happen more this decade. Financiers are hesitant and ESG requirements are making many shy away from oil and gas related projects and invest more in renewables. Thus, this is a final key challenge I'll mention as we may well be in the situation towards the end of the decade where there is a real need for new tonnage due to retirements in the floater fleet. But ensuring a return on investment for a five to $700 million rig when drilling contracts offered by oil companies of late have been short and often barely covering the operating costs is, is not a straightforward task and difficult with financing is not available. So that gives you a flavor of some of the challenges facing the, the drilling industry. That's great, thanks. I think that can resonate with a lot of the things that you, you covered there. Uh, I think it probably uh, covers more of the offshore sector than just the drilling side. Um, I, one of the points you hit on there, which I thought was quite interesting, uh, ha having had some recent uh, personal uh, exposure to the, the funds in Norway, is definitely we can look to Norway maybe as someone that's that's looked at their industry differently than than us. And, you know, I, I look and see how uh, some of our uh, competitors, are, you know, are, are are protected more by the Norwegian markets, and certainly that that innovation funds that, that are out there. It would be nice if we could get a piece of that pie, but it certainly seems to be tougher on the in, in the UK sector. So I think we can learn some lessons. Yeah, I did. I'd love to agree with you, you because um, I think you know, you know, since uh, late 2014, you know, when the industry collapsed, there really hasn't been much free cash to be putting into innovations. It's really been tough for us. Um, we're in a fortunate position where we are still a company and haven't gone bankrupt like some of our, our peer companies have done, but um, it's about being very careful. But if we do need, or if we do want to stay valid, we have to make these investments. We, we need to move forward as an industry. And um, like I said, you know, to try and raise money to build a new greener rig just now, it's, it's pretty, extremely difficult. That re yeah. uh, return of investment is incredibly difficult to, to be able to present to, to uh, you know, to the boards and, and what have you, of course, our customers at the end of the day. Yeah, okay, Brian, it's always, it's always hard to go second and I'm going third, so I'm not sure what's going to be left for me, but uh, what's your what's your take on the next 10 years? Yeah, really interesting, very comprehensive, Eric, actually, and just sitting back and, and listening. Probably a few steps further up the line a little bit with regards to uh, the flow of oil and so many of our challenges are identical, which is probably quite good because both our company, Technip FMC, and your company, Stena, probably do share, uh, share roots with regard to a, a Gothenburg birth, albeit a long time ago. Um, so maybe I'll take it from that tact and I'll go back to 20 years when um, the company I worked for was called Stena. And um, we were, I was a young engineer joining a company and I'm really quite interested to think what the future would hold. And I remember preparing for um, my interview and and researching a little bit as to where the industry was going. And and the first thing I was told is diving will stop. We won't be doing any commercial diving. It will all be undertaken by ROVs. 20 years later, not the case. Um, vessels 
the, the tonnage was DP1, DP2. That has changed. Now we're moving into DP3s, quite sophisticated vessels, and a big boom in building around about 10 years ago. Um, marine systems have improved for sure. Condition monitoring when it comes to our marine equipment, fantastic. The other thing that was going to be a big change around about 20 years ago is we were going deep, deep water. And this was kind of clear for us. There was a lot of certainty within our industry that I don't know we have today. We wouldn't have ROV, we wouldn't have diving, we'd be going ROV, fully autonomous. We were going to go deep. We did go deep. It's been expensive and it was facilitated by a really good oil price, which is cyclical and it's not as, uh, not as consistent at the moment, or maybe it is consistent, but consistently low. Um, when it comes to offshore construction work, the cranes get larger. The technology associated with the cranes and the installations definitely improved. Plastic heave compensation systems, constant tension, the ability to install in all weathers where previously couldn't do that. So, so that's where we were and what we're looking at 20 years ago. Now looking into the future, um, difficult the one observation I have that's probably shared amongst us all is that the rate of change is slow when we have a capex industry that depreciates over, in our, in our example, maybe 25 years. But between 20 to 30 years, you build and you need to use that asset consistently for all its life. Um, that means if something dramatic changes in 15 years, you can do a retrofit. But also, if you're going to do a retrofit, that's expensive and uh, you've got to capitalise that retrofit over the remaining life of the asset unless you're going to go into a life extension, which is which is not easy to do. So interesting, interesting path forward. Where do I see the marine side of our offshore construction moving? Um, I, I think the installation products that we install, so we install pipelines, but they haven't changed too much, it's still steel pipelines. There's been some nice technology associated with materials and cladding and other things that have made our pipes a little bit more efficient and deeper. Um, the SPS, the hardware, the, the, what we're putting on the seabed is largely unchanged. Now there's a big push from um, Technip FMC and others to reduce the size of the hardware. There's been a conversation ongoing for the last 20 years with regards to having consistency with connector systems across the industry and how all of the components fit together. Standardization, that could happen if we're smart. Um, autonomy, we've talked about that in some of the other sections. There is a drive for efficiency um, at the moment, and I think there will be going forward. Can we remove, and is it correct to remove personnel from the work site? Can we remove people from the rig or the vessel? Is something that I see is an opportunity for us, but also a huge challenge. Um, and and for me, when I look at something like that, it, it really only works when, you, when you've got a variable resource or you've got personnel or an activity that doesn't have to occur 24-7. There's specific and probably fewer examples than some people um, might recognise. Digital twin, of course, all the digitalisation. Cognify, that's something that we're also employing in our vessels. There is going to be definite improvements with regards to um, removing some of the previous processes that were very manual or mandrolic. Um, and I think that uh, we could improve using that technology and we can understand our systems better and we can move away from our old maintenance systems that are very much routine based and go into a proactive style maintenance with condition monitoring and be a little bit more efficient. So we're a very conservative industry of oil and gas. And uh, I think that uh, also there's going to be environmental factors which will definitely um, influence us going forward. I think that's something that um, our clients are very interested in. And if we're smart contractors, then we should keep an eye on what our clients need. So um, I believe that's something that is very interesting for us. Yeah. The the autonomous uh, shipping, I think, is, a, is an interesting one, isn't it? You know, I, I don't have the... The, the marine background myself but uh you know it, it seems hard to, to to imagine getting there you know i think taking people off you know thinking of the the legislation uh and and the rules that we have in place you know entering a 500 meter zone but you know, doing that without crew on you know 
seems seems that you know the redundancy that would need to be built into the vessels and the systems and you know the cost associated with doing it is certainly on our existing vessels to retrofit it seems like it would be uh, you know not not value for money in the end I, I guess from the safety aspect removing people off means there's less chance of uh, people getting hurt but uh, you know competency and training and skilled mariners on board you know potentially better than machines running them them, themselves We're interesting we, we did a trial a few years ago we, we were one of the first PSVs to have a trial conducted where uh, the manufacturer uh, took control of the, the control system sitting in San Diego when it was out in in the in the Aberdeen Bay and they managed to take it and you know do some figures of eights but we asked uh, a couple of the oil companies if they'd allow us to do a trial in 500 meters so even with the uh, uh, with the crew on board and the captain with his hands right next to the controls and we we didn't really get much take up on that one so uh, i think it's maybe a few years off before we get to that stage so um if i look at it from the the osb sector the side of things one of the other challenges that we have is we're a very fragmented sector um there are way too many owners uh, operating in the, independently uh, and we carry too much burden on on G and A because we're operating in, independently. There's very little control, um, and with the the drop off in, in demand, we've got you know, an oversupply. Even even before the downturn, there's a, there's pretty much as you've said, you know, overbuilding uh, through the through the cycles and getting into the OSB side of things, and, and particularly into the UK sector, there's virtually no barriers to to entry. It's just anybody can and can come in. And the UK sector is just a fallback for for most owners when when things go go bad in other areas. There's at least a spot market on the UK side of things, so everyone blocks back here. So, I think there's definitely a, a challenge to us as an OSV sector of how to address that. And consolidation is the is the key to it. Um, if we can reduce that GNA burden and then have a much more managed control of the market with a smaller group of operators. Uh, having more discipline in the uh, in the capacity of the market and also stop the cutthroat fighting to uh, to reduce day rates to get some form of utilization uh, you know I think it makes sense and I think most people understand it but you know obviously depending on which side of the consolidation uh, you're on uh, it doesn't it doesn't feel that great but you know I, I think in order to, to survive and to improve the industry as a whole it makes a it makes a lot of uh, sense i think what we've heard in the in the past cycles i think you both said we're, we're a cyclical industry we go through these these booms and busts and you know do we do we learn from them there's there's always talk of consolidation there's always thoughts that the market's going to get a point where uh you know people will be forced into doing things so the reality is i think everybody pretty much gets held up by the banks because the banks don't want to take the big write-offs and then we end up having to you know just surf through with the uh with the same number of companies and the same number of vessels it'd be interesting to see if that continues the banks have maybe stepped up a little bit more than they have in the past and they now actually own a lot of the assets um, and are in control of them so i suspect they won't want to be owners in the in the long term so there may be opportunities that that some control comes from from that um you touched on crewing eric and i think we're in the same position as yourself these new um challenging rules for quarantining people maybe when they join the vessel and when they go home um is is definitely troubling and, you know our ability to to hold on to our qualified seafarers that i think they're getting tired you know that they're they've had a tough time they've been squeezed down for the last six years the pandemic's now thrown that extra twist onto them the uncertainty even more so on their on their futures and stretching them in terms of ability to to get them home so my concern is that when the markets do come back as well and we do go to reactivate the stacked vessels and, and rigs is that skill fade and the and, uh, and the ability to attract more people into the into the industries so i think you know we've set ourselves extremely high standards in terms of safety and, com and competency that we expect and a lot of that's going to have have been lost people a lot of people have chosen it's time to to give up and retire and I guess you know, natural in a time where you're trying to save money, people cut back on their training budgets and, and, their, and their crew developments. So, 
it's going to be interesting when that uh, dynamic comes, when the markets do recover, because they will, and we will get more boats and rigs back to work, uh, what sort of situation we're going to be in with the crew. And I think we as, a, as an industry need to pay a lot of attention to that to make sure that we are delivering that safe service to our to our crews and making sure that they you know they're properly properly supported and don't just rush into it when the boom comes and you know there's money to be made just throw in the at it. I think we need to be um, very careful in our process as we as we go through that. And on the environmental perspective, obviously there's there's two sides to it for me. One is um, looking at our vessels and how we uh, get them to be uh, more uh, environmentally friendly reduce the emissions and then the other side of it is how we transition from the dirty world of oil and gas into you know the the, the uh, renewable sector um, i think both are both are here to to stay for a while to come um, and i think it would be remiss all this not to be looking at the the renewables sector so that's something that we need to to bear in mind but in in terms of the the vessels um yeah, I think it's a, it's a difficult position at the moment because, I, and we heard, I think, in the, the meetings so far, the technology is not where it's going to be at the point that we come up with the optimal solution. Everybody's still waiting to see what it is. Uh, you know, we've been putting batteries on, on vessels recently. Other owners have been doing it, taking a, a bit of a leap of faith doing it on certain vessels. But yet the clients aren't really um, saying that you have to have it. So they're not specifying it. And I think it, Money still talks at the end of the day. A, a cheaper diesel electric vessel, you know, will potentially get the job over a battery vessel, hybrid vessel, because you know it might not stack up to make the savings. So, it, I think where I see the 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 opportunity, well, other than in Norway where the charters are specifying it, they are funding it, and it is driving that area to go forward. Where I see the the, the opportunity, we really need to work better. Go back to somebody said collaboration. We need the, our clients to collaborate with us and, and accept that investing in this technology is a long-term uh, investment. You know, we can't we can't invest millions of dollars on a contract that's going to last for six months. We need we need to, to be a long-term partnership arrangement where they're sharing with the investment and it makes economic sense for both sides. And then we, as an industry, can then deliver that better environmental return to the. To the targets that are being being set so i think we need to work there as a, as a group and transitioning over to the renewable side um you know it, it's definitely something that's that, that we need to look at i think it's a, again it's a, as we said it's a high capital cost to build a vessel to get into it the the sector it seems from what i you know from a, the area that we would look at which is either the survey side or uh, the maintenance rigs it seems the margins are very low because the clients are demanding new vessels. But the truth is we could most likely um, retrofit our existing PSVs, which there's, there's an oversupply at. But you know, these are nice, shiny new wind farms, and I guess they think that they need nice, shiny new vessels to, to service them. But then we're, we're stuck with all these PSVs that at some point don't, you know, don't have a future. So I think we're missing an opportunity, and if the, the industry could see rather than coming out saying we need uh, such a high specification you know they can change their needs and we could give an extra lease of life to these vessels that already exist rather than potentially putting them on the on the scrap heap before their time so i think that's a i guess my summary is uh, you know three areas really we need to we need to get the osv consolidation moving in the in the sort of the, the immediate terms so we've got less fragmented less quote g a burden market with more control in the fleet it gives us a stable platform to to then invest in the greener technology and to move into the, the, the new sector so uh, that's my tuppence worth on on the first question and so um, it doesn't look like harry is going to to join us so we'll uh, we'll, we'll move on um the, the next uh, specific question uh, that we that we had um, was how we as an industry manage declining opportunities by shock or adjustment. Um, Brian, do you want to go first? Yeah, I can take a stab at it. It is very difficult um, with regards to vessel owners, um, our companies. Uh, again, I have to, to restate it's high capital. We have to pay off those investments over a long period of 
that reacting quickly uh, is very difficult because we plan ahead to, to have a certain amount of revenue to, to um, cover our costs. And I, I think that what we can see is that we are adjusting. I think that over the last period, renewables has become um, very interesting. And you can see a lot of uh, companies in our space adapting to that market more specifically, rather than just being a, an on top type of um, revenue source, it's more, um, which I think is very positive. And I think, as you said, you and this is not just uh, property, this is something that's going to be with us for a significant period of time. Um, adjustment is harder, and we see in Aberdeen and probably all over the country that there has been adjustment in order to reduce cost base, in order for us to become more more efficient operators of our vessels and try to provide exactly what um, what our customers need, um, what our customers need and what our customers expect versus what we can do is a real challenge. And um, I, I think we need a little bit of patience and and an understanding that uh, when we come along with these big assets, whether it's a drill ship, construction vessel, platform support vessel, then um, then we can't change them. Overnight, it's not like uh, trading in our car after three years and you, you get a new one. Absolutely, Eric. Yeah, no, I, I think I could just carry on from where Brian was. You know that you can't just trade in a ship or a rig. You know, we we built our rigs for twenty five to thirty years of service, and uh, you know we have a an older semi submersible that we've invested on. It's a bit like Trigger's brush. You know, we've invested over her whole <laughs> life, but she's still forty years old. But uh, <laughs> ultimately, but the you know she's got a new heli deck, the new drilling equipment, and uh, and so on. But uh, I think um, it is it, it does become as a shock. You know, we, we talk about managing risk quite a lot, but risk is different in many ways for, between an investor and uh, an engineer. So uh, what we did see, you know, during the boom time was an enormous amount of money that was just poured in without really thinking about the end result. You know, without thinking that, you know. The oil price could change quite rapidly, which of course changes the uh, the appetite that the oil companies have to to continue drilling. And uh, we've seen this time and time again with these these oil shocks. Of course, uh, I think um, consolidation is likely to happen now as a, as as a result of the bankruptcies we've seen with uh, the public companies. We're shielded, obviously, being uh, private, um, but I think it will lead to a bit more discipline there. But um, you know, where we work, which is much the same as you uh, um, both as well, you know, we try and provide what the client wants, but it's very difficult when you're building a new unit to know exactly what the, the client wants. And we, uh, much like um, the Sten offshore that you'll remember as well, Brian, we, when we built the Sea Well and the Well Servicer and so on, uh, when we built our drill ships, we put just about every bell and whistle on just in case, but we didn't get paid extra for it, which, uh, which was quite frustrating. But in saying that, um, when we when we came out of the drill ships um, from from 2008 and on, we managed to secure long term contracts. And then, of course, there was much more of an appetite with our clients to put money in together to get something better out at the end of the day. The, it's it's changed an awful lot now. Um, collaboration, of course, with the clients we have is, is 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 great. It really is. But we're doing much more campaign drilling. In other words, we are going to drill at well as opposed to drill for a company for five years. And of course, the investment that that company will want to make into the drilling unit is, is not quite the same. And uh, with their rates the way they are, um, in many cases, barely covering the operating cost of the unit, it becomes much more difficult to, to justify big capital investments. That said, if we don't do these investments, we just won't remain relevant. And we won't be able to get work in the future. So we're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place in, in, in many ways. Now, of course, with you know, public perception is is, uh, is a is a big issue. Now, I'd like to say that we we you know we, we we strive to push this through our company as much as we can, and I think people are on board, and I think that is really what is also encouraging uh, new people to come into the business to try and clean up our act because we realise that the oil and gas industry. It, it does need to remain for quite a few years, certainly out of this decade and the next decade as well, I would argue. So we need to remain valid from that uh, that front. Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, follow on from that, I think that, uh, you know, in order to deliver some of the renewable solutions, we need the, uh, the, the 
offshore oil and gas industry to help to, to develop it. So, you know, I think in terms of supporting the, the offshore wind, uh, you know, I think there's it's going to be some conventional vessels, diesel electric vessels that will, will support going forward. And they'll need the, the, the oil and gas out of the ground to <laughs> until the, those vessels are converted. So, yeah, I think there's, there's time to come. Um, yeah, I, I, I tend to agree that, you know, that the shock hits us um, but I think we adjust pretty well. I think we're we're a resilient um, group of, of people, as you said, innovative. I think we've all been forced to take a step back um, and, and look and become more efficient. You know, it's a great word. Efficient generally means you know cutting things. Um, technology has definitely helped in that way. I think you know the, the companies that probably uh, performed the best are the companies that will have invested in technology both offshore and onshore, and not not real, not just not to. Just reduce the the the, uh, the burden of the number of people that we employ, but really to, I, I guess, almost make people better at what they do and give them better information instead of plugging information into the systems. Actually, get the information automatically out of the systems and think about it and do something with it. Do your trend analysis, those those types of things. And I, I think we've definitely come a long way over the last five or six years with the tools that, that are available to us. Tough to invest in that during the downturn, but I think if you did, it, it's definitely helped. You know, when I think back to the, you know some of the previous downturns, we, we all uh, adjust and react um, to the downturn to get to get through it. But when the the boom comes again, it's very quick that we forget about it, and we've probably all been guilty of it. Once once the you know the bank accounts start filling up again, we all become less efficient again. And I think every cycle has probably been the same. I, I, just a little bit of reflection on the, the the pandemic hitting so close after the the last down cycle, which we weren't really out of quite yet. We were coming out of. I think it was still sharp in people's minds. So I, I feel like we adjusted much quicker in to the pandemic because of what we'd gone through over the last four or five years. We hadn't forgot the lessons we. And probably in the last cycle, we were slow in our initial reaction because we thought it would get better. And then it drags on, drags on, and you, you're forced into being uh, more efficient. I think we were much quicker as an industry to react. You know, you saw that in the the speed that vessels were laid up, that rigs were laid up, that, you know, that we, we looked at our onshore operations and, and paired everything back, which, yeah hopefully protects the industry so that when it does recover with oil price the way it is, if we can get over the pandemic challenges, um, you know, we should get hopefully be able to reactivate um, you know, in a much better way. One of, one of the questions I would have for you as a follow on for that is I mentioned, you know, the UK side of things being a, a, a quite an open market. Um, you know, in terms of adjusting, obviously we can adjust out of being a, a UK market player to being a more global player but how do you feel as a uh, you know having to face the fact that we are so open in the uk do you, do you find it much more challenging working internationally than it is for our international um competitors to come and work in the north sea you know brian you want to um, it is it's difficult from, from from my seat, um, I'm looking after international operations, and when we see the difficulties associated work, with working in some markets, particularly when it comes to people working in uh, certain areas of the world, um, it, it makes those operations more expensive for sure. Um, the other thing it does when we have to change our crew on our vessels, for instance, then we lose the continuity, we lose the efficiency in one side that we're pulled for. So so mm. we're all looking for the opportunities. We're looking to ensure that we employ the, the correct labour, the competent labour, labour that's truly international for international fleet, for international vessels. We should have an international labour pool. Um, when you go to uh, some areas of the world, um, for instance, maybe picking in some countries unfairly, but Australia, Canada, really tough. So we have to essentially sometimes double up in personnel so that we've got the competent people um, who we can rely on, who know the job, who ensures, ensures the job is safe, as opposed to um, putting a fresh um, bunch of people on who learn quickly, they're smart, they're good. But uh, mm. it makes it particularly difficult. Now, 
we can see that um, over the last um, preceding five years, we thought that the US was going to go that way as well. There's obviously big discussions with Jones Act anyway, even getting the asset into country um, and operating the assets. Um, we'll see how that transpires um, going forward now. But, but generally in Brazil as well, we see that um, we can see that there is more nationalistic protection regards to people, particularly in tonnage. Brazil is a, a really, really tricky area for us to operate in. We do have Brazil flagged vessels. Um, but it, um, it doesn't make our operation efficient because what we would like to do is move our fleet internationally as to where the work is. There's a real challenge for us, um, which makes the UK very attractive because we can take a vessel and take her into the UK, import and have very few restrictions. There are some, of course, but very few restrictions, which makes it efficient, which is probably good for us in the UK when you look at the, the jobs that we forecast. Um, we look at the client base in the UK compared to our client base 10 years ago, even where we would have 80% of our revenue from four or five companies. Now, 100% of our revenue comes from, I think without exaggeration, 45 companies. So it's a, a difficult relationship for us to manage as well. The, the account managers have got a, a lot more names in their, in their um, file of faxes. But it's it's probably good for the UK because I think it can make the UK quite an effective place to do business and to undertake off the operation. Yeah, that's good. Uh, do you have any thoughts on it? Yeah, I think, you know, we, we have two rigs working in the in the UK at the moment, um, and the rest are, are uh, what were the place I was going to say? We've got one in the Bahamas, It's uh, when it's finished there, it's going to Mexico. We've got one in Suriname, when it's finished there, it's going up to Canada. We've got uh, two in Guyana, which we're hoping will we'll stay there for quite a while. So we're used to moving rigs around. In fact, the global footprint that we've had in the past is enormous, um, and, and that was a big change for our company moving from semi-submersible rigs, which typically don't transit very fast, to uh, to the ultra deep water drill ships, which, okay, compared to a, a you know uh, big merchant vessels, they maybe only go twelve knots, but they certainly move. Uh, oh, we're going to the sailor ones did. So uh, we 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 have tried to base um, the way we run our rigs on on the UK safety case requirements. Um, so we've always been quite strict in that regard. But of course, moving a rig uh, to, to a different location, we also need to adapt as well. And it is, depending on the country, uh, there are you know, significant hurdles to jump over. Crew nationalization, I think Brian, you touched on there. Um, that, uh, you know, we, you know, being a potentially hazardous industry, we, we, we always try and maintain the, the, the lead crews on our rigs anyway. But, um, but we've made good inroads, particularly in Guyana with uh, local crews. Uh, Canada, of course, is another place, but again, a uh, fantastic workforce there as well. But it does take time. It does cost a lot of money, of course, when you uh, when you consider moving a rig to different uh, different areas. And of course, training, which uh, ultimately is, 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 is so important, particularly in, in these hazardous industries. So, um, yeah, if we were just in the UK, of course, uh, our, our job would be much uh, much more straightforward, I guess, but the work isn't here at the moment for us, and uh, and that's why uh, you know we, we, we remain a global company. Yeah, no, I think that's my experience. Golf Mark did it was global, but not compared to Tidewater. And um, you know the benefit Tidewater has is actually has the footprint in the in the different countries, which I think you know if it didn't have that, and you're trying to operate as a UK entity in those countries by sending boats randomly to them, I think it would be uh, you know a real a real tough thing. I think having the the actual bases and the footprints that you can operate locally and you know you have you've set the standards ahead of time i think that, that definitely helps okay we'll move on we've got we've got about 20 minutes left we've still got a few questions to to cover so uh, we'll, we'll go to them next um eric um if you could cover we, we talk about um electrical conversions of modern rigs and whether or not that's uh, something that's possible or you do need to go out and buy uh, you kind of touched a little bit on it, but if you want to go in a little bit more detail for us. Yeah, so we, I'm just thinking that two years ago, we, we decided we were going to build our rig of the future, and that was going to be a, should I say, a fully electric rig, albeit it needed uh, massive diesel engines to, to power the electrical plant. But that said, we were in, you know, putting in much more uh, electrical equipment, much more efficient equipment, and of course, an awful lot more uh, hybrid uh, solutions using batteries, uh, waste heat recovery, 
and so on, but also exploring diff different fuels as well. But I think um, the difficulties we have having global rigs is that you cannot always get the power or the, the types of fuels that you might want at that time. So what we have seen in, uh, in Norway now is electrification of fixed platforms, which is, uh, you know, and, and power coming from the likes of wind farms and so on. We looked at a design of a rig for Norway uh, about a year ago, which uh, was going to utilize a um, basically a, an electrical connector that you could pick up off the seabed and plug in to allow us to shut down uh, our diesel engines. But that really would be a new build rig, totally new. Um, so we have, uh, given the the fact that you know we, we are an asset-heavy company, we've invested a huge amount in our, our own rigs, and to try and keep them valid, we are uh, we are looking at all sorts of um, so we say energy saving ways, uh, you know, that, that we can build in, and that could be from installing a battery pack externally on the rig uh, to uh, to using closed bus technologies and and, uh, and so forth. The problem right now is if you're going to build a new rig, you are uh, there was there was a couple ordered in, uh, back in 2018, uh, and that was the, the low price of 425 million dollars. Um, those rigs were fairly low spec albeit built to work in Norway the uh, the owners they have now walked away from these rigs uh, in the shipyard and uh, the question is who can afford to build them but the outcome is that there will probably be much more than, than that at the end of the day uh, it's getting that money to make that investment which will be very tricky in the future particularly when uh, other financiers don't want to put the money into this industry they'd rather put it into uh, into the renewables, which you, you can understand based on, on perception. So there's a lot to do, I think, with cutting uh, waste, making our, our current rigs much more efficient. A lot of it comes down to training as well, using digital solutions uh, to really examine where uh, where we are wasting, uh, or where we could make uh, improvements. So um, that's, that's kind of where we're at at the moment. No, that makes sense. It kind of segues into uh, Brian talk about the uh, environmental challenge with your subsea construction vessels and, and potential hybrid conversions and alternative fuels? Yeah, it's um, it's a, a real challenge for us and it's a challenge that presented internally and also probably driven by our customer base as well. Pignip FMC have got a, a drive now for uh, 50 by 50, so it's a really aggressive target that we're going to cut up to two emissions um, by 50% in nine years. So. How are we going to do that? It's a question. The one thing that we are, or we're doing many things, one thing for me um, that's very exciting, one of the projects I'm looking after is the conversion of one of our DSVs to electric hybrid battery, uh, currently in Gdansk. It's, um, it, we've, we've kind of hit a few of the subjects before, and, and, and for us, we've done many models, what's the different business cases associated as to which vessels we could realistically convert. Um, one main parameter is vessel age. You, you can't really convert a vessel that's old because the payback has to be under such a, a short period of time. If you, you try to, in our business anyway, if we try to put a conversion in place for a 20-year-old vessel, it just becomes too hard. The payback, the, the cost associated with that would make the vessel very uncompetitive. Um, sweet spot for us um, is under 10 years, so we would have a 15 year uh, remaining life. I think Eric maybe mentioned Innova earlier on. Innova have helped us with this. This is uh, probably one of the key drivers with a significant um, grant. And I don't know if we would have got to go ahead in order to do it with an over grant. I know the business case did not work. The return on investment wouldn't have been there. Do our clients like it? One client um, in Norway particularly likes it, will drive for it, and we think it will be beneficial. Will the other, we talked about 49 clients in the North Sea, do they care as much? Mm, not so sure. What are the benefits other than um, carbon reduction? Well. I think the one thing that we also want to talk about a little bit more is carbon. Well, CO2 is, is the brand, CO2 is what everyone talks about. That's just one of the greenhouse gases and that we could be careful about. Um, when you've got a battery hybrid, you reduce all emissions. Um, and we hope to achieve 20% with um, a DSV. Uh, DSVs 
when they're sitting in uh, DP when they're on a dive site. We have lots of um, spare reserve or spinning reserve in case there's an issue on the vessel in order for us to minimise any crossovers and immediate uh, power requirement. That's how we dive, it's right. But by having a battery, it really improves that. It allows us to turn our engines off. And if we can turn the engines off, we're going to save fuel. We can run the existing engines to a much higher efficiency level. And uh, by saving fuel, we also save cost. So I think it could help our clients here in the North Sea as well. Those who may not have the exact requirement for energy efficiency to be built into um, their projects. But really, really interesting. Um, and I think that over the next 10 years, we'll probably see quite a number of vessels in the offshore sector uh, transition to battery hybrid. The other options that are available to us, and I know it has been discussed in some other sections, are uh, burn for fuels, biodiesel. Uh, biodiesels present some issues uh, in themselves. Um, there's two types of biodiesel. We have actually used biodiesel and currently um, are burning biodiesel in two of our vessels in working in Indonesia um, as a client requirement by contract. The biodiesels are plant-based. And we, we look at that and we can see that you can calculate the carbon reduction because the plant has obviously absorbed um, carbon through its life. However, um, the, the, the technology we're really looking at is uh, HVO, which is waste oil recovery. There's obviously only a certain amount of waste oil uh, in the world. And it's not just come from, from restaurant food or plant. Other um, industrial waste, potentially making paper, for instance, or for work for different applications to have waste oil. That is incredibly, incredibly clean. And we think by burning that, we could have a CO2 saving, and I'm talking about CO2, but CO2 saving of 85%. But it comes at a penalty. The, the cost of it is multiples of NGO. It is, it is expensive. And we have to look at who is going to fit the bill for that because um, in our contracts with our clients sometimes we pay fuel, sometimes the client pays fuel directly but in the environment that we're sitting in today, this COVID environment, this very tight cost environment, nobody really wants to pay for it. Um, a lot of our vessels are also fitted with um, tier 3 NOx rubbers and there's a catalyst required which is a consumable for that, a few thousand dollars a day but where, where legislation in the country doesn't require us to use that, we find that it's not particularly interesting to use it because we're so cost conscious. We, we, we talked about it as being very efficient and efficient cutting cost, and that is one that, that maybe suffers. So it's an interesting dilemma that we're going to go through. I think being olive green we can be in our industry, but being as green as we can is going to come at a penalty, which is cost. Will, over the next 10 years, will we be willing to pay that penalty? We'll see, I hope so, and I think we'll to next time. Yeah, I think those are, those are good points. A little bit of experience with the uh, on, on the, the PSVs. We have uh, three vessels now converted to uh, battery technology as, as well, um, two specifically because they're working in Norway and you know, the client expects it, uh, which, you know, it, we're, it's early days. We've, been doing, we've had it for about a year and a half. Um, so we're now starting to see the savings, and, and you know we can, because it, it's a leap of faith what what you're told you're going to save compared to actually what you save. Because how much time do you spend on DP? And that's where you're going to sp we're going to save the majority of the money, rather than when we're steaming, which is a, a maybe a marginal saving. So um, I think we can put the, the proof behind it, and but I think it does come to, to what you said is it's a big investment that's got a long payback time. So retrofitting it onto onto the rigs or to the vessels. It needs to have a life of, I think you're right, ten plus years to to, to recover it, um, especially as the clients at the moment don't seem to be willing to pay for it. And I mean, literally having a discussion with a client today, where they're actually trying to reduce the rate on the vessel that's got the battery over a, a standard diesel electric. I'm like, you're going to be saving money by using the other one because you're burning less fuel. So, you know. It's going to take time for people to uh, maybe to get educated to what the actual savings are uh, and it become more of the norm. 
for Ben Wimmer. So, Ian, I, I just quickly glanced at Bob's question, if I could just quickly take that because it's yeah. related. And he, he asks, uh, what extent are we getting necessary support in alternative fuels and infrastructure? That is something I'd like to highlight that we would really appreciate support on it in the UK. Norway, we're getting support when it comes to plug-in electric, when it comes to alternative fuels, it's a bit easier to get the support in the UK. Uh, if we could have some support, with, some support with regards to infrastructure, with regards to guidance, with regards to grants, that would be very helpful. Yeah, I would, I would second that. Having some experience in Norway as well, you say short connections, those types of things, there's funding available for that. And that seems to be a, a relatively inexpensive and quick solution if we can plug our vessels in when we're in port. Uh, and, and use cleaner electricity, then uh, you know, that, that makes sense. Norwegian ports seem to be doing it with funding and we can get grants as well over there, but not in the, in the UK side. So, yeah, I think, Bob, if that's something that, that your team could take, that would be useful for us. Um, okay, we'll quickly jump to our final question, uh, just was around uh, any potential catalysts or agreements in place for OSV fleet tonnage reductions. Um, I can go first on this one if you, if you like. I'll, I'll be be quick. I, um, as we said, there's I think there's too many OSV PSV companies out there all managing their own positions. Um, they've all got lots of vessels that are old and laid up and probably will never come back into service. And the truth of the matter is, they're probably wasting tens of millions of dollars uh, having them tied up. Some with crew on board, some maybe not, just rotting away. So why are they doing it? Um, I, you know, I think probably telling their banks that they're going to be able to get them back into service at some point with the, with, a, with a business case showing how much they're going to make so you know it protects the uh, the covenants that they have on their on their on their debt but uh, I think in reality that it, it's not going to happen you know I think any of these vessels that are 15 15 to 20 years plus and have been laid up for more than three or four years have got very little chance of coming back and, and, and should really be moved on to, to clear the way to go this is the true fleet of vessels that is there and you know that's the competition not this fictitious um uh, book that that will never come back and um, psvs do not get much money back from scrapping them so maybe that's another thing you know you, you get very little there's a, not much scrap in the in the vessel and the, in the, not much steel in the vessel and you know, a lot of the equipment's obsolete so nobody really wants it in, in any event so you, I guess there's the cost to get the vessel to wherever you're going to scrap it and make sure it's been done according to the to the legislation so is there going to be a catalyst to to do it I don't think so will there be an international agreement to do it I don't, I don't think so I think it's going to come down to each individual company being being disciplined and you know I can speak as Tidewater you know we've gone through the last few years of disposing of a huge number of assets because we could recognise the amount of money that we were pouring down the drain, keeping them alive when they were never coming back to work. Better to save that money and focus it, invest it in your uh, existing tonnage that will work and, and get rid of the others. But I think it's just a, a discipline thing uh, that we need. Unless oil companies will come out with really hard rules that say we will never hire a vessel over 20 years again. And some of them talk about it and they probably wouldn't, but unless everybody came out and said it or there was some form of class legislation or flag legislation you know that might change it i don't see it happening so uh, i'm not sure eric you said you, you may want to touch on that as well well i, I think the the point you had there with regards to consolidations uh, is, is is an important one you know we, we're seeing a lot of our competitors that are going bankrupt and of course you know if you if you go to the, the port of las palmas for instance you'll see loads of derricks just wind up along the quayside and sitting offshore for example and the big question is, when will these rigs come back? And the cost to reactivate some of these rigs will quite potentially be between 30 and $70 million. Uh, and some of these rigs are only 10 years old anyway, but you stop the recertification of your equipment, then you will have problems in the future. Now, when you have a company going bankrupt, the chances of um, the, the financiers giving you money to reactivate a ship for a contract, which may only be six weeks in, in duration with nothing on the back of it is, is incredibly low. So uh, I think at, at the moment, you know, we, the modular, the floater fleet is, is somewhere around about um, 160, 170 or, there, or thereabouts. There's been a huge amount of scrappage already. That will continue. And of course, fleet utilization, hopefully with a more stable oil price will come up. 
But uh, <clears throat> the oil companies uh, in general, they they want to pick the best units that are out there. They're getting that uh, that chance to do that, and uh, and I think a lot of the uh, uh, you know, the, the debt holders they'll just not want to spend money on the order rigs and quite honestly they will just be scrapped they'll sit there for quite some time cold stacked and then uh, and then eventually be scrapped but you know th there you go into this supply demand game again as well and what you know we shouldn't have is something similar to what we had you know back in you know 2010 where the oil price was shooting through the roof everyone was wanting to, to build rigs and get in on the game and uh, and then of course the, this there was a massive oversupply and, uh, and then when the oil price fluctuated and then dropped, boom, again, you get the bust cycle. So uh, it's it's difficult, isn't it? It's um, Having that discipline is always always difficult when people get the dollar signs in their eyes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, we've only two minutes to go. Um, there were a couple of other questions. Uh, I'm not sure we can really touch on them too much. Um, Mona's question, do we think COVID-19 vaccination passports would help improve our crew change problems? I think anything could help our change problems if the government listened and maybe thought about the um, the actual uh, industry that we're in, where our, our seafarers, our, our crews are effectively um, quarantining on the vessels when they join the vessels, you know, or they're coming off of a vessel they've been on for more than two weeks, so they've been quarantined before they come home. You know, hopefully, you know, that's message, and I know the chamber do a great job in prepping that for us, and I'm sure we'll, we'll continue. Um, hopefully, COVID passport might make vaccination passports might might help um, as as with better testing regimes potentially as we, as we move forward um, and a couple of questions on the the, uh, the outlooks for uh, for crew um, yeah I, I think I definitely can see that the crew are people maybe have their tickets and they're there I think our my, my bigger concern was that it wasn't so much that they're not necessarily there it was more about the some people have sat at home for the last two years and, and, and not, you know, sailed a bit, sailed on a vessel or, you know, carried out their duties on the on the rig. So it's making sure that skills feed is, is brought back. Anyway, thank you very much for attending the session this afternoon. I hope the people that listened in found it interesting on behalf of the chamber. Um, thank you, Eric. Thank you, Brian. Uh, enjoyed the, the discussions. And uh, thank you again to our sponsor, Anglo Eastern. Um, the next session is a plenary session which um, Richard will moderate again and we shall summarize uh, our discussions here so thank you thank you very much